folks, welcome to Uncommon Sense in Current Times. I'm here with Sarah Westall, and um, uh, we were just kind of talking a little bit before the show, and you know, she's with the the podcast, the Business Game Changers, the Sarah Westall Show, kind of depending on uh, uh, how you want to talk about it. I guess it doesn't really matter what it's called as long as people watch it, right? Um, and so, um, so first of all, just welcome to the show, and I um, uh, appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm just kind of curious. So, so how did you end up kind of getting into the podcast world? You, you, you told me earlier that you kind of look at things through, through the lens of, of kind of the way you grew up and, and you have very, you're very opinionated based off of, based off of that. And so at some point in time, you had to sit there and say, you know what, I want to, I, I, everyone else needs to know my opinion too. I mean, like what, what you know, <laughs> where, where did that start? Like, how did, you end, up, how did you end up kind of going in that direction? My opinion is so important. People need to know about it. No, I really, what happened, <laughs> something so vain. What happened was back in, I think, 2014, 2013, I've been doing this for a long time. I got approached to do a business podcast. And so I started off doing, and that's where business game changers came. I did more of the edge of change, uh, edge of change in every, every kind of way, you know, society, uh, business, uh, politics, geopolitical, just new inventions. And it was always bu business, more business focused. I tend to still have a, a business focus in, in compared to a lot of people, although it, it's broadened out to, although it's, it can be more political and social sometimes, but it still kind of has that bent. But I, uh, I started doing that. And then I learned a lot in that process. And I started realizing that the world wasn't quite what I thought it was. And uh, you, you learn pretty quickly when you talk to a lot of experts around the world that there's inventions that can cure cancer or that you have these free energy devices or you have all these amazing things for humanity. And I couldn't figure out why is this, why has this been shut down? You know, why are we having all, and then you realize all the persecution these people have been under. And then I got into realizing that human trafficking you know, I got into that and then I was the first one to coin. Um, we, I think we really, with James Rothstein on my show, Detective Rothstein, I took down more pedophiles than anybody, CIA pedophiles. And I think that changed, I really believe that changed the landscape because I was the first one to, to uh, he called it human compromise. And I said, it. it's the currency, blackmail is the currency of the powerful. And then people followed up with, you know, books and different things. It was always around, right? People always knew, but it became part of the consciousness with the Q movement and all of that. And that that episode was actually put in this Q Great Awakening book, even though I wasn't a follower of Q, not that there's anything wrong with following things. It's just, I just, I like to know who I'm following, if I'm right, going to be right. following, right? I want to... It, trust the plan. I don't want to trust the plan if I don't know what the plan is, and I don't even know who made the plan. You know, what I mean, I need to know some things. So, uh, but this this uh, book that that this interview was put into, where I said that, and James Rothstein was in. We did, you know, he we did it together. Actually, you know, creating some of the uh, details of it. It uh, sold millions of copies, and it was number one in seventeen. Uh, categories on Amazon. It was kind of a big deal at that time. And then they shut it all down and did all these things. But uh, so I've been around a while and I've seen a lot of things. I've got so a lot of stories. It, what was it that I guess, you know, because it, you know, it sounded like you kind of went in with this this mindset, uh, we're just going to kind of talk about business, kind of like the business down the street kind of type person and maybe, you know, kind of learn this and then something kind of radically changed. Was there a radical change or was it more like a dimmer switch that just kind of slowly kind of like, wait a second, wait a second. And then you're starting to put pieces I, together. I was never about the business down the street. I was always about what would the edge of change, you know, okay. the, it was always about what is the best in the world, the edge of change, the new technology, you know, just really paradigm changing you know, so I was looking at changes in history and understand just really the coolest paradigm. I wanted people's ideas to be challenged. I always want to be on the edge of that. And when you're doing that, you learn a lot. Because that's where you learn what I just, you know. Yeah. yeah. Was it, but again, was it, did you, did you know, like at the beginning, or was it more of a surprise to you as you started to kind of, the more you kept digging into it, that it was like, wait a second, there's, there's more, there's more under the surface than what, than what you originally probably thought when you started, or was it kind of, you kind of knew that and wanted to, 
to really talk more on that side? I was clueless. I mean, honestly, I mean, I knew some because I the, I knew the 9-11. I was questioning that. I dealt with a really corrupt banking system in my own business where I created a business. And so I saw some really corrupt things and I saw some things I was questioning. But that's different than really starting to get the point of what was going on. And maybe it was just a lot of us are just naive. We had to grow up. I had to grow up and realize the world is different. And I think I just went through it before a lot of other people had did. You know, there, there was people before me who were, were, otherwise I wouldn't have all the guests I had. There are people who figured it out. But I think a lot of us, you know, you grew up on the internet. And we're so, it's, the internet's different now. It's not as, as accessible as it was then. And we just learned a lot. And I grew up really fast. It's very traumatizing to learn you think the world is more rosy than it is. It's very traumatizing to go through those processes of learning things and questioning things, but it's also exhilarating. And a lot of questions are, there's a, you, you know, the more you learn, the more you know that you don't know, right? The people right, think right. they have, the people who think they have it all figured out, I, I don't, but come on guys. And you just like, really? Get, nobody has everything figured out. And anybody that thinks they do has it all figured out. They're not, there's something they, they don't want to, they, they have it let, here we go. They'll say it like this. The people who think they have it all figured out have it less figured out than the ones that realize they don't know that much. Do you think of the course. problem is more with those people or do you think the problem is more with the people that, that would just rather stick their head in their sand and just say, I don't want to know. Like I, I well, reckon there's probably something there, but I don't want to know about it. What do you well, think is worse? Well, I think that, I think that, it depends. If the people think they all have it all figured out and they won't go investigate other things and the, the way they have it figured out can be very damaging to either themselves or the people around them, then that's that's worse than being ignorantly bliss, I believe. But being ignorantly bliss, some people probably need to be that way because I don't know if they can emotionally handle that much. But for those who um, who can and they should be they should grow up and be adults. They need to learn and they need to help us and they need to be in the fight. And I think that's the majority of people. And so who's worse? It depends on who we're talking about. Right, right. right. But I guess really the people that are worse are the ones that are actually preventing that stuff that's creating those problems. No, I guess arguably right. they're the, yeah. <laughs> I guess if we were going to put it on a hierarchy. You know? That's right. So, so when you, when you said, okay, you know, this is, this is, this is kind of, it. you kind of started to kind of go down this road. I can imagine that, you know, you, you, you received all these, you know, uh, uh, glowing emails telling you how smart you are and, um, everyone just wanted to be just like you and no one, no one said anything negative to you at all. And, um, I mean, but you know, how did you deal with that? how did you deal with people that started to, to kind of attack you. I mean, cause there has been some level where you're like, maybe am I the, am I, am I crazy? And they're the right ones. I mean, there had to been something there that, that started to kind of trigger. How'd you deal with that? Well, you know what? I think there was always a balance of enough people saying, Oh, thank you so much for covering this or thanks for having the courage and coming, coming out that balanced out the ones that said I was a crazy conspiracy theorist and a nut job that I, it was it was like the support structure and then I just knew it was true you know when you just know something is true and they're trying to tell you you're crazy and you're like no I can tell this is one plus one you know I'm like I know I'm looking at a, a green blade of grass that kind of stuff that it you just don't want to back down from that and I think the support of enough people saying thank you and you've helped me or that to counteract it was that, so when people are nice and they actually are supportive, that does help a lot for people right. like me. It, it really does because there's enough to balance out all the, because the negative you get, for me, it was worse when you just get canceled everywhere and censored. And, you know, that's really hard to deal with, I think, because you just, you can't, it's like, you're always hitting your head against the wall, trying to penetrate through. And for a while there, when the internet was free, you were getting through and now they've gotten more sophisticated, right? We keep looking for free places to go, but people are lazy and they want to stay with whatever is easy. And so when you get kicked off all these mainstream platforms, most people just stay there. You know, it's, they got to follow, they got to look for 
their people, the people they want to learn from and not realize that a lot of these mainstream platforms, you're not going to find them there because they're telling you the truth. So right. you got to go somewhere else. Yeah. Even though, you know, you're there, but maybe you get 2000 views, whereas you, were, yeah. you know, it's just not. Yeah. The, the, the algorithms are, are, that's right. Are, yeah. You know, it is, it was funny. I did a video, um, that was, that was really taken off, uh, expressing how as a Christian, uh, I, I, I'm very much against happy holidays from not only from a logical perspective, like it makes zero sense to me logically, even, even if I, but, 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 uh, and, and the video was going crazy. Then Facebook took it down and you know, we had to fight it, fight it. And they were like, Oh yeah, our bad. And they put it back up two weeks after like January 1st. It was like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's that, that becomes really relevant now for you to do that. I <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I just, I just got kicked off LinkedIn a couple weeks ago. Which, like, Did you yeah, really? I, yeah. I, you know, I had like 15,000 followers or something and I said, you know what? I should just post stuff there. I get like 300 views of a, a post or something. It wasn't a huge contributor to my, you know, listener base, but I had people watching and listening and, but I posted a thing about the FDA in January, um, removing informed consent because they did for things they deem safe and effective, which they did. And they deem COVID jab is safe and effective. So I put that and said, reminded people that that was, you know, that was safe and effective. So this is what we're dealing with. Um, LinkedIn took it down and said it was misinformation. And I said, no, it wasn't. And I sent them the um, the actual wording from the front page of the FDA change in regulation. And, and then they apologized, put it back up. And then right after that, they had about 20 posts where they claimed that I was doing something that was illegal. I was selling illegal or unregulated products. And I tried to reach back to them and said, well, first, I don't sell anything I advertise. And from that perspective, you're probably more likely to be selling something illegal than I am. And as far as being unregulated, every you sell unregulated or market advertised unregulated stuff. Do we really, everything needs to be regulated? So I, is it legal or unregulated? And I will, what specific product am I advertising that's illegal or unregulated? And they would not get back to me. They took me off and that was it. Total oh. thug behavior, total thug, bully, awful behavior do it lie it's it's a total lie and they won't address it that's the kind of people we're dealing with see you know and that's that's the piece for me i recognize the 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 value of protecting them the way you do newspapers you know the way you do tv back in the 1970s and 80s i recognize there was a purpose of the value it, there was a value for the purpose of that but when you seem to when you go intentional because even newspapers they when they did some if they did something intentional they were still liable In television if they did something intentional they were still there there was that their standard was tremendously more but big tech has seemed to have gotten the the benefit without without the the regulation without the consequence and and they like this game of playing between I'm a I'm a private business. I can do whatever I want to, and well, I'm a public service and a public utility. They play this game back and forth. There's no ethics. There's no morals. They're just no. bullies and thugs, and they hide behind a regulation. So they're not behaving to a standard that's appropriate for a civilized society. Just some basic standards of operation that you would do to treat people with common decency and respect. If they're going to take something, you at least tell them what it was that caused the issue that they're identifying. They can't even do that. That's no. beyond, that's, a lo that's just basic, no common decency. The Demas' family has been in the restaurant business for many generations. We have been serving people in the Middle Tennessee market for 34 years. Try our spaghetti kits, our pot roasts, which we slow cook for four hours or a world-famous baked chicken and rice soup, which many locals have dubbed Greek penicillin for when you feel under the weather. We make our food fresh, and upon placing our order with us, we freeze the order and send it to your house. Demas's is more than a business. Five generations of restaurant operators have taught us many things about food, but more importantly, we have recognized that we don't sell food. 
We sell the experience of bringing people and families together, which our country desperately needs. So go to DemasFamilyKitchen.com and share in this journey today. And for right now, use the code UNCOMMON to get 10% off of your order. That's DemasFamilyKitchen.com. You know, they, you, YouTube did that to NRB TV. They were like, you, you did something to promote terrorism. And they're like, which, which show, what episode? Like what? And they're like, no, you have to figure that out. Yeah, like, come on. <laughs> really? I know. You yeah. know, because in our VTV, I mean, they, they are. They're they're very radical. <laughs> but still, if they don't want a, a show that doesn't fit whatever, then tell them this right. is too radical. But you you got to at least be have some kind of integrity. I mean, we should expect these behemoths, if they're going to have that much control on our society to have and that much uh protection from our government which we supposedly pay for they should operate with higher standards than being bullies and you know no respect for i mean that, that's that what the linkedin did to me or what youtube did to me too or what they did that youtube did to them is a sign of zero respect right yeah right so so you've been working on a project recently a uh, uh, fifth generation warfare um explain to me what is that like how do i what, what what is fifth generation warfare well it's what we're part of you know mind control psyops fifth generation warfare fifth generation warfare is the landscape of your body controlling your mind and your body and using that to win war right convincing you that you know to give up be without fighting or um, think something isn't what what it is, and so I'm I am speaking at the Red Pill Expo about this, and I'm also doing a series with uh, Brighton University, and I, uh, I I'm looking at I, I started doing some of these things. I have a big tech background, and I started looking at stuff from a technical standpoint, do weapons and and more of the advanced technology that they're using. I start talk to targeted individuals, realizing there's the frequency. I was really into free. I am really into frequencies and how they're using it for many, how we can use it for many things, but it can be weaponized. But, you know, I, so I've done so many documentaries right before, right when COVID hit, I was like, okay, this is a mine. There's a lot of mind games going on here. And I did a little mini documentary then, and I've done three different um, conference. Every year I do a conference presentation. Um, I don't know every year I did it. I think the, the, the last four years, I might've done three years at the false flags and conspiracy theories about this, but I'm taking it to a new level now. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at it from like a 360 degree from a military stand, bringing in a lot of experts. And I'm looking at it from a military standpoint, a psychological standpoint, a targeted individuals, a big tech or not. Yeah. Big tech and technology. And um, also I'm bringing in journalists to look at the history of it. And, and uh, I think I said political. So I'm looking at it from a kind of a 360 standpoint of how all of this is affecting us. And, and no one person can be an expert at it because it's really broad and really vast, right? It's, it's a cross-discipline thing that's going on. But, I'm, uh, but the big tech and technology is, is a lot of the foundation of this, you know, with media, social media, weapons, uh, military grade weapons, the targeted individuals are being used as experiments to, to they, they perfect it on them and then roll it out. They've been doing this for decades as far as the psychological part of it. But the fifth generation warfare is confusing. Like you don't know who is doing what. Um, it's on purpose. A lot of this chaos, you don't know who you're fighting. Um, there's multiple actors that looks like you, you're fighting. I mean, all of this stuff is on purpose, the fear, ratcheting up the fear. And so it, I'm looking at it from all of those perspectives to give people an idea because you need to have some discernment here and don't let yourself get sucked into this. Right? And they use your own mental constructs against you. So, and they do that even with the the weapon systems they use. They What affects you the most? It's all experimental, but if you're really um, religious, they use that against you. If you're um, women's rights, uh, you know, women, they're used, they're notorious about using women's rights in order to advance the abortion agenda. So it depends on how you look at it, what it is that they're doing. Every single one of us is a target in some way, depending on what's the most important to you. All right. There's a couple, couple ways. This is kind of, 
so this is this is kind of cool because I guess if I, if I'm looking at it from I, I'm just going to say from a a everyday person perspective, and I hear this, my 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 first thought would be, okay, it's so vast that we can't get a handle of it. But if since it's so vast, how does it coordinate with each other? It's not like there's something, you know. So so when I think about it from that perspective, it it almost seems implausible because it's so big. That, that one thing would trip up another thing, which would trip up. So even though it might work, it would also seem like it would fold just as quickly. And then on the flip side of it, I look at it from a Christian perspective and say, this sounds just completely spiritual that, that you're dealing with, because that's the only thing I can think of that can handle something of this nature. So, so. Well, where, I mean, you look at. Some of you the big tech. Yeah. Well, first of all, the complexity, yeah, it is complex, but so are large corporations. We have like these big tech companies are the largest companies we've ever had in the history of the world. And they're organized in a somewhat fashion. And you don't even need it to be one fourth the, as complex as one of these big behemoths. And you can run a whole entire war game. You only need, you know, even if I, there's eight elements to it, like I look at it, when I look at it from a 360 degree, that would be eight divisions or something. And then they have to cross work. And when you look at it from that perspective, if you can create and run a big organization like Apple or Google, you can run this. It's so people have to understand that it it's complex, but not that complex in the sense of it's very possible with people who are pretty smart and capable. The problem is we have to be pretty smart, capable and ruthless and not give a crap about people. The other part of that is you're right where there are a, move, a lot of moving parts in the fact that there's us out here and we're out here making it hard for them to figure it out. So from that perspective, we have a huge advantage because the more we know and the more they can't play the games against us, the harder it is for them to implement it. But they've been working for decades trying to figure out the patterns of how to control people. A lot of these things, like you, you'll see... I'm going to bring this up. I don't know where you believe, where what side you believe on this and sad that there's even sides, but when it comes to like, um, yeah, when it comes to the Israel Gaza thing, okay. I don't want to get into the emotional part, but October 7th is very, was very clearly a false flag with all the information that's coming out. Right. The IDF um, stood down for, first of all, Hamas was practicing and doing their training for months beforehand. There's many videos showing them training, you know, the journalists that have really dug into it. IDF sit, sat down for six hours before they came in. That's impossible based on their, their ability to control that little space. They have a completely, you know, 360 cap coverage. That doesn't happen. Um, they also implemented a Hannibal elective that mean they killed a lot of their own citizens. That came out by that that's a hundred percent it happened they also are funding hamas and they still are okay those elements means that it was a false flag no matter what you and then here's the psyop the narrative around it is that then the media then points to that continuously as the reason why we're there they're pointing to a false flag as a reason why we're doing this whole thing there's there's adult conversation to be had about Israel being an important ally and all the issues that belong. There's a ton of issues with that, but there's also um, questions on our role in the United Nations. You know, where we're the only country that didn't support Palestine being a state. Whatever you agree on that or not, we are being isolated on the world stage with Israel. Why is that? There's some bigger narratives going on here, and people are. We just were watching everyone buy into this. And to me, this is classic uh, fifth generation warfare where they create a horrible event. So a lot of the people died. It's absolutely horrible. A lot of innocent people, but it was orchestrated. And then they use it in the media over and over and over, over again of how horrible that was. And then that triggers people's emotions and they, they use the Second World War, the Holocaust, which was horrible, as a way to get people to support. So they have these, these emotional, psychological triggers to get you to support some agenda that they're doing. But No matter where you see it, you, we got to be able to see through things like this. Otherwise, they can easily manipulate us. But what about the people who have gone there, who have who've, 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 who've 
been there, seen the tunnels, who's seen, you know, the, 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 the who, who... I'm not saying any of that's not true. I'm just saying October 7th was a false flag and that we're all being manipulated based on a false flag. And so you have to, I'm not saying any of the other stuff isn't true. There's so much truth that goes behind psychological operations to make it work. But that was a fabricated event of some sort with, and we need to have adult, because now if you look at X, X is um, allowing someone like, I don't usually like to use names. I'm going to use a name. Stu Peters puts out a post that says the, the, um, the Jews need to be killed because they um, killed Jesus back in the day. And now they need to pay the price for that. Right. That's like a Nazi. Yeah, thing. I know. He it's, says it's, that. It's okay. Stupid. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. Right. Yeah. He's not censored. Why is he not censored? Meanwhile, the journalists that are actually digging into October 7th and figuring out what really went on and even the most objective people are just saying, this is what go went on. We need to have adult conversations about this because I'm really freaking sick of being manipulated. I don't care where you land. All these people, a whole bunch of innocent people just are whatever. Maybe nobody's innocent. It doesn't matter. But this event was fabricated and that's bullshit. And you should have more respect for us. Those people are being censored. Well, Stu Peters, who's talking about acting like a, a psychopath, is not censored. But is that is that really new? I mean, because I I think about World War II. I think about you know Pearl Harbor. I think about the fact that you know the the that the U.S. ships you know many of them had had had, had moved away from Pearl Harbor right before the bomb of it. There's yeah, there's a lot of evidence yeah. out there indicating FDR yeah. was aware. There's also evidence out there indicating he probably wasn't. I mean, there's you can kind of you you can make the argument from a historical perspective both ways, but. But I, 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 I'm aware of other historical examples. That's probably the closest one to what you're saying here. Is it? Is this really a new thing? And is this really fifth generational warfare? Or is this oh, something I'm, that a few people want to kind of change? The new thing is the power they have over the media to this level. And the way that um, they always had the Mockingbird media, right? But they're taking it to a new level with... Um, with social media and people are, and they know how to do triggers, the emotional triggers better than they used to. The other thing that we're gonna be talking about is I have you know really good tech people who, that measured like during COVID where they were sending subliminal messages to people to tell them to go get the shot, right? They have all the, the they have proven tracking the signals and things. So, whether it was widespread or just in pockets, we don't know, but that's happened. So they're implementing all these different things. My point of bringing that up, and that's why I warned you before, because it's a, it's a very sensitive topic, depending on where you're at it. We are being manipulated, period. Because whenever an event like that, I refuse to believe that the IDF, and I even with Rudy Giuliani, who was hardcore a pro-Israel person, I brought up, even he admitted that needs to be investigated, okay? Because that's bullshit. You can't, the, the IDF is too good to not notice that in their small little area for six hours. So it wasn't just a normal failure. And um, so these kinds of things, when we're being, these aren't coincidences. These aren't, we can't be this naive. And I just use that because that's more on fresh on people's minds and trying to challenge people. If every single time something happens, it takes us two years to figure it out, we're going to constantly be behind the eight ball. We can, we got to notice it as it's happening. And that doesn't mean Israel isn't an ally of ours. It doesn't mean that, that you know, if you are uh, uh, believe from a Christian perspective that we need to support the uh, Jewish people, it, fine, all that's fine, but we're still being manipulated and we can't allow ourselves to be manipulated all the time and and wait for two years before you know where it really all has to come out and then everybody convinces everybody and we have to go through this whole two-year process meanwhile all the damage is done we have to be able to see it as it's happening and that comes from having the foundation like when i saw it i start i saw it me i started seeing things immediately that's where we get need to get more people up to speed so that there's a chorus of us saying Hey, wait a minute. This is this is smells bad. It's bad. We have to take a step back and be adults and figure this stuff out. We're not you know, going to evolve until we get there. 
Yeah, you know, and I'm and I'm I'm not at the point where I would say, you know, that that every country, every person, I think, has a level of corruptibility. I, I, I so I recognize that there, there's always that possibility, but I also recognize, and I work with people enough where you do things even on a micro level. Uh, where people jump to conclusions, jump to assumptions, and that if we're automatically moving and jumping to that right from the start, you know, when anything happens, when we're trying to explain gross, let, let, let's assume the IDF was grossly incompetent, which they're an amazing force. I, I, I would agree that that's kind of a very, that's a stretch to say they're incompetent because they're not, they're amazing, they're amazing force. So, but let's just say that they just really messed up that day for whatever reason. Why? That's cut naive, down. but go I ahead. Know, I know, maybe, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not, but let's just, let's, let's just say that that was a possibility. If we start jumping to those conclusions on everything that happens, does that run the risk of creating the chaos in society that, 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 that we don't? And I guess that's why I'm asking that question. I, I, no, that's a good question. I think automatically jumping and assuming is different than holding out and asking questions. And um, hold on, I apologize for that. I didn't know it was on. Um, I thought it was off. My sound was off. Oh, uh, that That's different than holding off, asking questions, not making, uh, jumping to conclusions, not jumping to conclusions one way or the other until right. this evidence comes out. And what I'm saying is usually within the first few weeks, because I, I was horrified too, but usually within the first few weeks, you start smelling stuff, you start seeing stuff. And then based on who's censored and who's not, that gives you a better idea too what some of the deep state is doing or what actors who are in power are screwing around with. If it was legit, these things shouldn't be censored. Not good information should not be censored. You shouldn't be... And when you see that, that are the indicators that there's something wrong. And the reason I brought up the Stu Peters thing is why is that not censored? If they no, really, I, yeah. you yeah. know what I mean? If they really are are backing what they're saying, why are they not censoring stuff like that? Because they're trying to create this chaos. That's why there was agitators and all these different uh, we protests on both sides paid. You know, I've saw you know videos and proof of aid advertisers creating this chaos so the the point isn't to uh you should never jump to conclusions on any side or the other and hold off and and, and but that people in my position people like me we shouldn't be we should be able to get it quicker and then help inform people too many people in my position are paid off stooges or just going with some narrative because it they're paid off, right? Or they just want to fit some bandwagon, or they're afraid and they won't say anything. But people in positions like mine who have are expected to bring forward good journalistic integrity and share with people what we learn, we should be able to get it quickly and share with people and not be part of the game. Average everyday people that go to work every day and don't do this all day long they absolutely but they rely on people like us right so i i 100 in, am in, in agreement in asking questions and i and i work for me i think the the covid what was happening during the covid narrative even before the vaccine when the vaccine came up i think it just exaggerated but anybody asking questions about it it wasn't even making statements they were literally asking questions for me, watching the response and reaction to them, that was to me was very frightening. And and it was interesting, even among my even among my small circles of friends or or whatever, you know, I, I remember going for a walk and and running across people and just asking questions about, you know, like the, the effectiveness of masks, whether or not they're effective or not effective. Cause you know, all that information at that point in time was all, you know, Fauci changed his mind to think three times in a week, you know, and <laughs> so you started yeah, asking yeah, those it, questions. And and I was uh, and, and I would run across generally well doctors know so we're just going to trust them no matter what and or, or you know again it was that 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 pressure that was put on and so I recognized I recognized there okay that the, if they're trying to shut down my questions instead of answering them that that's completely different and I and I and that's when I start digging in and want to ask more and more questions but when I see things that. Um, 
but I don't always just jump to saying, okay, wait a second, I need to ask questions here. That's I need right. to do this. And, and I, I don't, you know, so sometimes, so when you say, I, I don't want to wait two years, this is, this is, this is not a fair question. I apologize, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How long do you think is appropriate to wait before you start well, saying, I need to look at things? I, I don't want to wait two years before I'm, a, I'm backing an agenda that's killing a lot of people. When, when we don't know, and there's too many questions, that's what I'm saying two years later. And we're like, well, finally, our questions are answered. We've started people on my, you started figuring it out really quick. I mean, like the COVID thing, that's why I knew, I knew because I could see they were censoring, they were censoring treatments and banning effective treatments right. while pushing out an experimental uh, vaccine. That means those two things together meant that there was an operation going on. It's just, I, I've been doing it long mm -hmm. enough now. I see it. You know, I'm like, this is an operation because you don't, if you cared about the general we welfare of the people, you're not banning effective treatments, period. End of story. It, if people were dropping on there, you would be using those treatments. I mean, anybody who gave a crap about, especially treatments that were very safe, you know, you could argue whether they work or not, but if they're very safe, why are we not giving it to them? Why are you cramming down this experimental vaccine? That right. to me, before any other things was so obvious, right? And then with the mass, what made it very obvious to me it, very early on was the fact that all the studies before said that masks weren't, weren't, weren't useful. And then suddenly after COVID came out, all the new studies, no, but we got new studies that came out just when COVID happened that shows you that masks are, are what we need to do. But before that point in history, for a hundred years, they knew that they weren't, uh, they weren't going to make a difference. Uh, so that's another indicator. It was so obvious. Once you start seeing those patterns, it becomes really obvious, you know? And so that, that's what I'm talking about. Right, right. You know, it, it was well for me when I when I heard Fauci say, you know, you don't need to wear a mask, but don't buy masks because we need to save them for our nurses. And I'm like, wait a second. Well, if they're not if they're not good, then why do we need to save them for the nurses? And then later we had to have them, and it didn't matter what kind. And then I was like, well, I wanted to dig into it, so I actually went to the CDC site, and the headline of the CDC was like, basically, masks are effective. The study shows it. And so I, I started reading the summary of the study and I was like, oh, well, here's the study link. And I clicked to the study link and it, the study link actually didn't say what the article said, which didn't say what the headline said. And and so that's what I was like, OK, wait a second. I, this is there's something else here. But then the problem I had is I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a you know, I, I, I'm I, I'm a curious person and, and I'm, I, you know, probably above average intelligence, not super smart, but I'm like, I don't know where to go because you're right. You go to the internet and all of a sudden all that stuff was getting shut down and you couldn't find it. And then you would find people out there, some of which are probably pretty crazy. I mean, like, you know, legitimately like nuts. And then you're like, okay, That's are right. they the nuts person? Or are they just sounding like they're nuts person because they're not everybody else? That's hard. How do you, how do you distinguish? How do you well, determine that? I have a science background and so I can read studies and I, I saw patterns, you know, those two things that I saw was enough to tell me there's something seriously wrong here. I had, and then I interviewed the top people in the world. I, let's dig into this. And then I came up with the solutions document. I don't know. I get really, I get really into a zone and I can figure stuff out. Do you know what I mean? But those elements that I told you just about five minutes ago, that was enough to tell me that this was an operation. And that's what I have gotten good at figuring out. And I, I'm not 100%, obviously, but you start to identify operations. And then you start to figure out what's really behind it. There's still questions about the mRNA and the spike protein and all this stuff. That's still going to be going on for a long time as the scientists argue and do the research. Okay. I'm not going to know all that, but I knew it was an operation and this was bullshit. And I know there was um, effective treatments that were way better. So, and so when I say, I don't want to wait two years, I'm not going to back them hundred percent. Like all those people said, I'm just going to listen to my doctor. Who's an idiot. The doctor didn't know anything, but they were going to back them and just listen to them and turn their brain off. 
In Acts 5, we see that when Peter and the other disciples were ordered to stop talking about Jesus, they responded, we obey God and not man. In 2020, we saw something we never thought we could see in this country. They shut down our churches. After decades of removing God from schools and public institutions, they went straight at our community. Unfortunately, we as Christians did not know what to do. And even worse, we chose to listen to false prophets masquerading as Christians on how to respond. I recognize this is the only beginning, and we need to know how to respond. We have a duty to say no to unjust laws, but as Christians, we have a greater duty to God. In my book, On the Duty of Christian Civil Disobedience, I use biblical teachings to help believers know when and how to stand up to those in charge when they ask us to commit evil. You can go to peterdemas.org to find out about our duty to say no. And when you type in the code UNCOMMON, you can get 10% off your order. That's UNCOMMON at peterdemas.org. Remember, we are to obey God and not man. That's the kind of stuff. I'm not going to just follow somebody in some operation that's going to cause a ton of damage, going to cause war, or going to go, to, you know, that's that's major based on BS when I know that there's questions here. That's what I'm not going to, what I don't want to wait to. I'm not going to let them do this for two years while I ask questions. I'm going to say, no, this looks like an operation. BS on that. We're not supporting you until you prove to us that this is not an operation. Not when you're going to, when COVID, you're going to shut down businesses. You're going to hurt all these people. Um, same with wars. No, you're going to war and a lot of people are going to die. So no, I'm not supporting it when it looks like an operation. You prove to me that this isn't an operation because it smells like an operation from every direction. When something's more legitimate, doesn't smell like enough. Like if COVID was legitimate, people would be dying everywhere. We would have been back in all this stuff. I mean, we would have been like, holy shit. You know, we would have been doing, but then those treatments that were banned wouldn't have been banned. Not if the people were legitimate. So you know what I mean? It's like yeah, you see no. these operations. Yeah. That's what no, I mean it, by not waiting for two years. Right, right. And you know, and and, and the thing is, is it, and I I think discussions need to be had on what is and what is an operation. I think I think I think those are those those ferreted out. I think it, today in this culture, if you disagree, then the other person's the enemy, and I think that's just that's unhealthy as well. But Absolutely. let's just let's say let's say we determine that it's an operation, and yeah, we say okay, we're not going to support it. Uh, okay, you know, whether we support it or not support it is irrelevant whether the operation is still continuing or whether the operation is still having the impact. So, so we, let's say we, we get to the, we draw this conclusion. Now what, like, what do we do? And, well, and there, yeah, the... we can speak about it, but okay, <laughs> you know. Well, thank you for that, because that's the big question. For those of us who can see it, it's like, it becomes torturous to watch a slow moving train wreck. <laughs> it's torture. And you're watching this slow moving train wreck and you can't do anything. All you can do is try to help more people see this stuff so that the next time it doesn't take us two years. Do you know what I mean? Like right. COVID has been essentially derailed, but it took a long time. It'll take less and less time to derail these operations, the more people that can see through it. But you're right. We don't want to derail a legit operation or a, not I shouldn't say operation, but a legit situation that we right. really need to defend ourselves. But but good journalists see see this and say, yes, this really happened, people. And then they, you know, but you you start to identify that there isn't there isn't there isn't the inconsistencies and the lies that are so blatant from the people who are running the operation. If it's legit, it's like, okay, this is happening. You know, it's, it's, a uh, it becomes, you start seeing the patterns. And now you, you, you said earlier, you made some comment about, uh, you know, reporters kind of getting paid to do that. And I'm aware of that, that happening. I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of evidence out there, but with the volume of, and I'm going to go with just traditional media. I'm not going to, to uh, like people, people like you or, or anything, I, but the, the traditional type media. I would argue that it's less about somebody paying them off more than it is about the laziness of it. I, I, I do, do you, do you think it's more, do you, do you agree with that? Or do you think I'm, do you think I'm being naive on that one? I think that it, you aren't syndicated unless you're, you, they know where you stand and that they can control you. And I think that 
certain people want to be part of a hurt, almost high school mentality where they're going to fit the, whatever the narrative is, they're going to parrot that because they want to be part, they won't go against the narrative. Those are the people who are allowed to do syndication. They won't go against the official narrative. They're afraid to go against it, even though they seem all tough and everything else. They're not, because if they see something that is conflicting, they shy away from it. They won't cover it. And they won't cover it for a couple of reasons. It's not just because it's a high school type mentality. It's also because they make a lot of money and it puts their career at risk. It's right. not any different than a doctor who saw what was going on and was silent. It's the same. Book. Yeah. Yeah. There was a book I read, golly, it's probably early nineties, maybe late eighties by Ben Bagdikian called Media Monopoly. And he was talking about how the media is no longer becoming competitive and he was creating talking about these problems this was like i said late 80s early 90s before the internet was really before al gore discovered it you know what i mean <laughs> you know so <laughs> yeah I, before he discovered it <laughs> that's hilarious um but but yeah i you know and, and and i recognize that being a problem and i remember having conversations with people about it and everyone's like oh it's not a big deal it's not a big thing and and i and i think I, we're seeing that now and i agree with you that 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 I think a lot of people do that. So we're, we're getting kind of closer to the end. So I got to ask you a question to get your opinion on this one particular person. And I know nothing about it outside of just a little bit of casual. So when I look at Tucker Carlson and what you're talking about, you know, because like he was obviously popular, he had to move up, he had to do it by, by being kind of part of the, the group. And then all of a sudden, like instantaneously, he was not part of the group. He was outside of it. He kind of was edgy on it. He had that that ability. Where where do you think he kind of fell? And you may not have any opinion on it either. I'm just kind of curious because what you said, he kind of seems to be in and out of that mold you were talking about. I'm just curious. Well, okay. I don't, I got to at least couch it in that you don't know for sure unless you're in the room when right. they're having the back room conversation but I can give you a couple of data points. First of all, when we were all kicked off YouTube back in the day, our, the collection of us that just these, the people who sued Google with me, we had higher numbers than the mainstream media did because 2 million views uh, compared to all 17 of our channels, you know, like the, he might get 2 million views at night. We would get together, would get more than that, you know, with all of our shows. So we were, we were beating out all the major mainstream media channels. Um, and they needed to do something about that. They needed to cut us off. And that's what they did overnight. They cut us off. The ones they kept, they put into a box, right? Then they brought in all those mainstream media people to take over. And the whole landscape is changing and it's worked effectively. So it's a couple, couple, it seems like it's too big to happen, but it's not. It's that's how they, they need to control the narrative. So they did right. it. Now, when it comes to Tucker, is he part of that takeover thing? Well, let me just tell you, I, you know, it's really hard to know. Same with Elon Musk. When you look at their backgrounds, it's like, well, there's a lot of indications that they're involved in all these things. Tucker Carlson's dad was CIA. Putin even said, you know, you, thankfully the CIA didn't take you and you wanted to be part of the CIA. I think that was an indication. Uh, but, you know, he gets out. He's, Fox didn't stop paying him. He starts this network. He's making way more money on the network. He did an, an agreement with um, uh, Elon Musk, who himself looks like he's uh, all involved in, in things. And he's getting way more views than he ever did on Fox. And he has this uh, subscription network where he's making way more money than he ever did on Fox. Um, is he just doing a, a good business move or is he controlled opposition? I don't know. I mean, some of the stuff he's doing is really good, but usually good controlled opposition uh, covers about 90% truth and then the rest is not truth. And it's usually at the times that are more important. Like when uh, uh, the election happened and it didn't go or, you know, it didn't go, um, right. or it was obvious that it was rigged, right? Yeah. Um, that's when Tucker pulled the plug and didn't support Trump. It was right at that. It was a crucial moments when he was doing things. Now, was he being pressured from above? Maybe, but he still did it. Okay. Maybe he had to do it in Fox news, but you look at those are the things that happened. And is he still going to operate that way? That way. 
I mean, I, to me, it looks kind of obvious that he is, but unless you're in the back rooms, maybe he's a high level person. Usually people like him that have that much control that's against the narrative uh, would be entirely smeared, like in a big way, you know, and he's not. Right, right. You, you know, yeah. there's just all those little indica indicators. You can still learn a lot from some of his interviews. Some of them are right. really, gr really good, but that doesn't mean that he isn't controlled opposition. So, you know, but yeah. fifth generation warfare, a lot of it, it, it's a good point. This has been along around for a while. Fifth generation warfare doesn't like uh, ignore all of the learning that's happened for decades or centuries. It just right. incorporates more and more sophisticated technologies and uses the technology like this, the social media that we have and the big tech that we have can control us in ways the Stasi would be drooling. I mean, Robert Epstein did a, um, uh, a study in Australia where they created misinformation on Twitter in Australia on a couple candidates and the misinformation, 87% of the people changed their vote based on the misinformation and only 2.3% or something realized they were even looking at misinformation. That's hmm. the power of these. these right. Yeah. And how are we going to beat this if they have that much power without informing people and to start seeing it as it's happening and fighting back? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, I've, I've, I've enjoyed this conversation. Um, I've, I've uh, immensely, um, it's been, um, uh, you know, cause when you're looking at something like this and, and you're, and you, and you, and you start thinking about kind of how it works and you, and you recognize that, there's definitely some, and there's definitely some not, and then there's this gray area where it falls. It, it does. It makes it. It makes it. Um, it. It makes it complex. It can also make it. You know where where. I don't know. It can create that division that that we that we don't want need to have. And um, but I, so I, I, I again I appreciate it because I think the more we can have conversations about this with with everybody. I think that 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 will help open the eyes, and because I don't I don't think there's an opportunity to fully eliminate it, but I do think if we can continue to help, kind of make it open, make it accessible, and make people realize, okay, there's something we need to question without having to you know go out and hold a sign or burn down a building or <laughs> yeah yeah right. I, I, I think in, it's good. Uh, yeah, if we can become informed adults and have adult conversations on these things and not be afraid to ask questions, not be afraid. Right. You know, when somebody tells me that I was, you know, I invited on a panel and they didn't like somebody else on the panel because they thought they were misinformation. I'm like, I don't know if what they said was misinformation. I can tell you what I said was hundred percent true. And I also got to tell you that I don't appreciate you telling me I can't go on a panel with somebody that you don't like. Because that is pressuring us. You know what I mean? Oh, no, exactly. That's exactly. What you, I, had a, I had a conversation with my pastor about that today, actually. This morning at <laughs> breakfast, we talked about that. They were like, you can't have this person come to your church because he doesn't believe this. And he's like, I don't care. <laughs> See, now that's a good pastor. That's yeah. The perfect. Yeah, I don't know. But but I don't care. I don't like to help spread misinformation. That's very true. But the same standpoint, if you're going to be, a, uh, you need to debate and bring things to light. You can't be afraid to be with people. That's right. BS. It right. creates the division that you're talking about. So people watching this that that, that don't know want to know more about, about about you, want to know more about this. How do they how do they find you? How do they because obviously you've been canceled everywhere. So you you got it. You're kind of getting funneled into a spot. So what's the best way for them to find you? I I am on like a lot of platforms, but you can go to sarahwestall.com. Sign up for my newsletter because that's how you get on my Substack. And okay. if you're on my Substack, you'll get notices on everything. But I'm on all the the free ones, right? I'm even on Google or on YouTube, but I'm not. That's my third channel, and I get hardly any views. And I only put up about a third of my shows because otherwise I'll get, you know, strikes. But I'm on Rumble and BitChute and Bastion and Brighteon and CloudHub. And so I'm on all of these. So you can find me. But SarahWestall.com is the best place to go. And then sign up for my newsletter. And thank you so much for having me on. And I, that's why And I, I didn't I just want to say when we talked before, I wanted to just kind of lay out that my worldview was always about how do you do the best for the most people involved and a Christian worldview? I don't like to talk about it a lot. I just want to live it. I want to be it as much as possible. 
And so everything that I look at is how, how do we maximize what's best for the most, you know, when you look, you, know, you just want to hurt people. You want to do me good. Right. And, right. You know, just don't be a bad guy. Just be good. Tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> do something, do something different. Tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. I know it almost becomes cliche, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And so, yeah. Well, good. Well, again, I appreciate you being on. I really do. I love, uh, again, I love this conversation and uh, I hope we can have a conversation again about this because the, the there, there's obviously going to be more of this that comes up. So if, if, if so, sure. I'd love to be able to talk with you again about it. Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye.